one of the reasons why when you go see your GP and you complain about, um, or you know, he's worried about your cholesterol levels or your blood sugar, heart health, whatever, right? One of the reasons why your GP doesn't prescribe exercise is because he can prescribe you a pill. Well, that's not the only reason. One of them. I'm, I'm the other reason is because clients... the government is organized crime, but we can get into that later. Our guest today is Dr. David Pewter. David and I met at a starting strength seminar in LA back in 2017 or so. David's been doing the program since 2016. He's a fan of what we do. He, You are a clinical psychiatrist, is that right? That's right. So as a clinical psychiatrist, David has a unique perspective on the benefits of strength training for the mind. And so I wanted to have David on the podcast today to... Uh, Tell us what he knows. And and David, <clears throat> if you don't mind bearing with me, I've got a bit of a preamble to share with you. So I Let's think that we're in bad shape, you know, collectively in terms of the psychological health of, I don't know about the world, but I can tell you for sure uh, in the anecdotes that I observe through friends, family, through people I interact with on the internet, through the the data that I uh, that I observe, it seems like we've got a serious problem here. Um, I've got a, a hypothesis to share, and, I, and I'm curious what your perspective is on this, kind of to set the stage and define the problem. So, you know, psychological issues are not new to the 21st century, but I certainly feel like they've been exacerbated by technology. So for one, this damn thing is the thief of joy, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I don't think, you know, when I worked at BlackBerry, we had a, our slogan was always on, always connected. And we thought that was a benefit, right? <laughs> um, and, and I don't think the human mind evolved to, to handle the constant stream of stress. And especially for people like me, like type A people uh, who always want to, you know, do their best and be on top of everything to have everybody I know able to contact me at any time and to have this device buzz in my pocket and alert me of that. And I've obviously I've changed that, but this is the, the status quo and then steal my attention away from the thing that I'm working on and then feed in potentially, if, if this is a social media notification, feed in potentially the, the anxiety associated with um, wanting to make sure that you are not ostracized or embarrassed by your, your social group, um, the FOMO effect, all the things that, uh, that our minds have evolved to pay attention to in a social setting is now, is now on all the time for everybody mm -hmm. who has a smartphone. So I see that as a, as a major issue when it comes to having peace of mind and a settled mind and being in the moment. Uh, which is the opposite of being anxious. And the second thing that I see as a major contributor to this is is actually part of, of the smartphone effect, which is all of the, I hate to overuse the word, but all the trauma that has been inflicted upon society over the past couple of years by the government and by social media and by the media companies. Um, using our addiction to this, knowing that the way that we observe the world, the way that we come to understand the world is via this screen. Um, and then essentially putting us through some sort of a cruel torture um, via the experiment that's been run on us. So I, I can elaborate that on, on that if you if, if needed, but I, I wanted to just start by saying that I think this is a serious problem. Um, I would love to get your perspective on the problem in general. I, of course, would love mm -hmm. to get your perspective on how strength training can help to solve the problem. I've got my view on it, too. Um, 
And but before we get into all the details, what do you think about that point of view? Am I am I missing something here? What's your perspective on it? So what I wanted to share was um, an article that I had written for uh, my website, psychiatrypodcast.com, in which I talk about this one study that looked at how much well-being drops the more hours of digital media per day. And so you can see like after about two hours, which like if we're going to be honest with ourselves, how many of us like two hours is pretty minimal. Um, but somewhere around after two hours, there's a precipitous drop in, in mental well-being. And once again, this is here, hours of electronic device use and percentage with suicidal risk factors. And after around two hours, there's an increase. And after four hours, a sharp increase. Um, and so that, that study and one other study in particular, which showed that social, as people increase their screen time, what also decreases is doing things, um, exercise, you know, normal things like interacting with real people, decreases. So yeah, support your sort of hypothesis with some data there. I would say it's not only that people are just on their screens all the time. It's also what they're not doing mm. now that they're on their screens all the time. And, um, and David, not one doing thing, thing, sorry, go ahead. I've got a thought for you to share when you finish yours. Go ahead. I was no, going to say, it's, it's so, one thing yeah. they're, they're not doing um, is producing quality work, you know, because in 2022, no matter what industry you participate in, you know that there's a decline in quality. You know that people care less. You know that people are less engaged. And you know there's less connection between people and less care for your fellow man. This is all anecdotal from my point of view, but I interact with a lot of people and I, I trust what I see you with my that. own eyes. Um, that's deeply concerning to me. They've done these studies on what people actually are doing on social media. You know, is it actually social? And 95% of it is completely unsocial. And so only 5% of the time are they interacting with other human beings, friends. Most of the time it's pure entertainment and it's moved that way more and more, I think, especially with the reels, Instagram reels and TikTok. And, you know, I'm someone who's, who, when TikTok was like, I think about two years ago, I was into it for about three months, posting all the time, climbed up to like a hundred thousand followers. And then I completely lost interest. It was like overnight, I had no energy to produce anything. And I just didn't care anymore. You know, I was like, I was like, these people, they don't really even know what I'm saying. Like, I love the long form. So with my podcast, it's great. But, but with um, the sort of the short clips, um, you know, it just, it just exhausted me. Um, it's I had no energy for it. It's it's junk food for your mind. It yeah, and and I I can't say that I haven't been like probably using too much. So um, I'll be the first to say like yeah, just like you, I need to figure out a way to better, you know, rest my mind, you know, and not just listen to constant noise. Yep. Um, I think I think this has played into the worsening of mental illness. And I think as well with COVID, the isolation, the masks, not being able to see each other's faces, um, social isolation is like the worst for mental illness, you know? And so at the end of the day, when they're on social media, social unmedia, you know, they're not interacting with people face to face, which is really how we were evolved to interact with people. You know, we're, it's like so many old or not even old, so many old people and young men, both alike, like part of the, most of the issues that they have are like relational and quality. It's like, I had a patient this morning. I don't know how to make friends. You know what I'm like? Find common interests, find something where you can engage. Or like, I think about like the, um, I go to the Orlando starting strength gym. Oh, hell yeah. I didn't know that. And I've been going there for, um, about four or five months and it's been awesome before I trained out of my garage for literally five years, but pre COVID I had three guys come into my garage three days a week. It was awesome in the midst of COVID no one. Right. So I'm in the middle of just working out by myself and I finally got totally burned out on working out period. 
And then my wife, actually, of all people, was like, hey, I'm going to start to go to starting strength. And I'm like, what? I've been trying to convince you for, for almost a decade to try this out. Like, what? So was it our friendly, goes, welcoming environment or what was it? She goes, and I was like, I kind of begrudgingly started to go, you know, and then it was like, oh, okay. These are like, you know, and then when, when like um, recently Ian hit, you know, and it's like, who comes over to help? It's like guys from the gym, Hell yeah. you know, it's like, um, Hurricane Ian, for those like, of you not following the news. Hurricane Ian, yeah. yeah. Oh, I was in Orlando, so I got hit, you know, water all around my house, water in the garage. And for the first time in my adult life, I needed the strength beyond like, like something just mental well-being. You know, it was like, I, I've created sandbags from six in the morning till five at night and dug trenches that kept water out of my house. And if I would not have done that, our whole house would have been flooded. Hell yeah. You know, man. and it, it would have been a disaster. So the strength actually served a purpose in a time of crisis, right? Where like I had great energy all day just working hard. Quick um, aside on that one, David, not to interrupt your train of thought, but um, I want to mention an interesting forum post at the Starting Strength Forum by a guy named Fat But Weak. This guy, okay. Fat But Weak, is uh, definitely not weak. And he, I'm not sure where in Florida he is. It may be in the post. I don't recall. But um, he was out there working all day. Uh, and he was the only guy that didn't get tired and didn't stop. And this includes other people that are that are fit, in quotes, right? Like marathon runners and others. Um, yeah. So as we've said many times before, the biological system is quite efficient. And it's not going to hold on to, it's not going to waste resources developing or maintaining tissue that it feels like it doesn't need. So it will fall to the lowest common denominator of the stress that you expose it to. And if the, the stress you expose it to is sitting in a chair and playing with your phone and not much more than that throughout the day or the week, when the time comes for you to fight back against a disease or um, get your shit together and start filling some sandbags and saving your house, then uh, yep. you'll be in trouble. But if you go through the process of, of providing your physical body with more stress than it might need for its day to day, um, you'll be better prepared for when you face a more physically stressful situation. Yep. Okay. Here, here's my, I want to come back to this thought that I had though. Okay. Sure. Yep. So if the problem, okay, the problem of social media is it's unsocial media. You're not interacting with real human beings. The, the, um, what are you not doing by spending all this time binging on Netflix, watching your social medias, blah, blah, blah. You're not spending time with other human beings. And so when I went from working out in my garage by myself, which I like had completely lost energy for, and I had like an online coach and everything. Um, and I went to an in-person gym, all of a sudden I had energy to now work out again and progress. And, and the environment of the, uh, the Orlando starting strength gym, it's like, you won't meet better people. Like the type of people that want this sort of thing are like the best type of people, the people who will come to your house and help you sandbag, you know, and help you, you know, clean out your garage the following day. And so what I was thinking was how many people are in Orlando who are just lifting in their garage or at some, you know, in isolation, you know? And so my thought for why I really wanted to come on and talk to you was I really want the people who are like, like why they're asking themselves, well, why, why do I go to a gym? I could just do it in the garage. You know, why have a coach? Like I, for a long time, I didn't have a coach and I was like, I can figure this out myself. You know, I read the blue book, went to a couple seminars, you know, me and my buddy would coach each other. Like we weren't coaches. I tried out for the platform test at the second seminar I went to, I failed, um, which I'm a doctor, you know, like I tell people when I refer them to a, a strength gym, I'm like, look, the coaches there are very good. They're not like just your average coach because I tried and I was unable to do it. And I actually put in quite a bit of effort to try to pass this thing. Um, and you know, I think if I really wanted to, I could probably pass it now because I've been doing it for so many years and, but probably not you get a PhD because you can, you can handle the material. Yeah. No doubt about it. Uh, I mean, I, I mean, I have an MD, like, I feel like it, it's like if anyways, my point is that 
in-person coaching, the, the collegiality, it's, it's definitely needed in our day and our time. And it goes beyond just getting strong. It, it, it's like the friendships and, um, and, you know, being a part of being a part of something, people that want to do the same thing. So I think, I think that's really important. Um, and, and then, you know, I can, I can talk to you too. You're just absolutely exhausted about all of the studies. And I really do treat strength training and cardio as separate medication for hmm. mental health. Interesting. And there's tons of studies to support strength training actually being better for depression than cardio. But I would see them as like two separate hammers that I could use if I'm like really struggling. And it's the progressive nature of exercise that's really, really good, like start strength training in particular. So it's like, you know, there was one study in particular that looked at getting 50 year olds strong. And they found that the ones that got the strongest actually had the most reduction in depressive symptoms. There's all these studies on anxiety and depression and like risk of future episodes being associated with hand grip strength, which is a very sort of rudimentary way. You can, you can get a $30 hand grip strength tool from Amazon and check your strength and, and, and see how it progresses over time. Um, so there's, there seems to be this very strong association and the, the link between being fit and all cause mortality is the strongest link I've ever seen in my life. And when I read this one particular study, and I'm going to bring it up here because it's like, it was so groundbreaking to me. Um, now this, usually when they do like strength studies, it's like 50 people, they follow them for like, you know, six months. You know, this is a study of 122,000 people. And they had them do an exercise um, treadmill test. And then they followed them for an average of 8.4 years. And what they found was that, and then they broke them into groups. So they broke them into five groups. Okay. The lowest fitness group was the low performing group. So that's the bottom 25% on the treadmill test. And then the elite group was the top 3%. And the high group was like the top 22%. Okay. Does that make sense? How they split the split yep. them into groups and follow them over eight years? Yep. Okay. All cause mortality for the low performance group was 23%, 23.7% to be exact. So 23.7% of these people died. All cause mortality for the elite group was 2.6%. Okay. That is literally tenfold. Tenfold, yeah. absolute risk reduction. So when we look at studies, we look at relative risk reduction and absolute risk reduction. Okay. And I'm going to bring up just, just because I know doctors will talk to you to your blue in the face about statins, right? Hmm. Statins are a good medication. If you have a lot of risk factors, if you have diabetes, if you have heart disease, statins can be good. Okay. Statins but, can well. I'll I'll I'll, I'll like a, a make my point on that later. But continue. Sorry, Lip, Lipitor. But here's here's a big meta analysis. So they looked at a hunt of forty seven thousand individuals, okay, and they looked at randomized. So, so they looked at randomized control trials for people who are taking statins, and they're looking at cardiovascular outcomes and the reduction in future coronary events was twenty three percent to 29%, somewhere in there. Okay, here's my point. 23% versus if you were to move from the most unphysically fit group to the most physically fit group, that is a 1,000% reduction in all-cause mortality. 1,000%. And we have here in the statin study a 23%. Now, you can't compare studies like that, sure. But you can get the magnitude of the effect of exercise. It's just absolutely unbelievable. And I want to say one more thing about this this study. So let's say you could say like, oh, but like in the elite group, you probably didn't have a lot of people with diabetes or hypertension or like all these other diseases, right? 
And sure, it was lower, but they looked at controlling for all variables, and it was still like 500% more powerful on all-cause mortality to move from the low to the elite after controlling all of those variables. And if you looked at things like smoking, smoking was only a 41%. So here you have, after controlling all variables in the load to elite, once again, this is, this is an, uh, a hazard ratio. So it's like, think about, think about it as like 500% less likely of dying. Okay. Whereas this would show you 40, smoking would be 41%. Coronary artery disease, 29%. Diabetes, 40%. Hypertension, 21%. Ed, end stage renal disease, like 278%. Okay. So my point to this is exercise was more powerful than quitting smoking or smoking or not smoking. Like being in the top physical fit, fitness category was so much more powerful than any other variable that they looked at. And yet as doctors... Like, it's not like I'm standing, it's it's not like you hear from a lot of, lot of cardiologists. I mean, maybe a couple I've heard, you know, but like, I don't hear this from a lot of, a lot of cardiologists. Like, look, if you exercise, you could, reduce, you could reduce your risk of dying by not a hundred percent, but a thousand percent if you are literally immobile. And I have a lot of patients who like, literally, like I look at how many steps per day I pull, have them pull out their phone, pull out their health app, because they all, they, people always keep their phone on them. We can look at their steps. And a very cachectic, unmoving person, it's like 1,000 to 2,000 steps a day. What does cachectic mean? Like lying in bed all day, right, yep. binging on shows all day, yep. like barely moving, mm -hmm. like barely, like just bathroom, kitchen, bathroom, bed, like staying in bed. Like when I had this patient today who was severely depressed June and July, and his steps went down from 5,000 to 2,000 mm -hmm. a day because he just stops moving, mm -hmm. right? So I see these people who are this unphysically fit, like 2,000 steps a day. You know, they recommend like get 10,000, right? This person, 2,000. This is in that low 25% group, which increases their risk of all sorts of things. Why does it do that? And that's, this is the other thing I wanted to share. But I, let me, maybe, maybe I'll pause there here if you have any questions and then I'll jump into the mechanism. We'll this may be a three hour show. <laughs> <laughs> I have so so I may much. Have to uh, come back. This is this is really in my my area of interest. Um, let me check back at my uh, my notes here. So first of all, no shit, right? Um, it's wonderful when studies reflect what we all know to be true, uh, because then we can point to things that people will believe in and take seriously instead of just anecdotes and uh, you know pleasantries and conventional wisdom. This is one of the cases where the conventional wisdom is correct. If you are sedentary, you will yep. be unhealthy and unhappy as compared to someone who is not on average. I think you can make that statement unequivocally and it's wonderful that a, that a, that a study backs that up, but th that seems to be the case. Am I right in saying that? Absolutely. So then the question just kind of becomes, well, what, what do you do? What do you do to, uh, to not be sedentary? And the answer is really is just anything. I mean, um, anything. Just, just step one: get your ass off the couch. Um, here, and then, and then you can the, optimize, the thing. right? Because the, there's a whole the there's a whole hierarchy of uh, of what makes the most sense and what's what what is the most effective. And unfortunately, this is probably stratified based on intelligence and and work capability, which I think to an extent. And you, I would love your opinion on this. I believe that those are two inborn traits that have um, levels of deviation, but your inborn ability to work your ass off, um, nature, nurture, however you want to call it, people have a certain capacity. And the same thing applies um, to you know intelligence. And then those things relate to how, how likely are you to find something that is the most effective use of your time, will make you the happiest, and will put all the psychological triggers in place to cause you to want to continue to do that thing. And then, and then we, uh, th that cream rises to the top and those are the people that train at our gyms, which is really nice for me and for you because I get to interact with lovely people daily. Um, and so do you when you, when you get to go to the gym. So um, I know you've got a bunch to say in response to that. So go ahead and then I'll, um, I've got a few other things to mention too. 
Okay. So if I'm dealing with someone who is a very driven, high conscientious person, I can tell them work out three times a day or three times a week. I would not, not three times a day, work out three times a week. Let's start, you know, what, what are they interested in doing? Okay. Running. Okay. Let's set your heart rate for this goal. 135 to 145 based on your age group get out there 20 minutes and this patient today executed on that and it worked. She's out of depression. You know, we did a couple things and in concert, it was enough within one session. She's completely out of depression and she was like really deep. Okay. There are those people, they are rare. The, the average person is more, seems, seems to have a, uh, you know, a harder time executing on a plan in isolation. And with the proper team, a team acting as an environment, you know, sometimes you don't have the energy to change yourself in isolation, but you may have the energy to change your environment. And that change of the environment can lead to long-term change. So with that type of person who I know, like if they go and try to do this themselves, they will not be able to accomplish what they want. They need either a personal trainer, they need a group that they can go to, collegiality, they need something that they can do, which I, which is why I think like a lot of these gyms have been very successful, like Orange Theory and CrossFit and, you know, all of these things that keep people in a tight, tight unit, working together, working towards goals. Um, and I think it's really helpful. But I would say it's a rarity to find someone who has been able to execute a plan by themselves. Um, and I, I could, I could go back to my rowing days when I rowed in college, my senior year, my coach thought my technique sucked. <laughs> so he said, go teach yourself how to row. So he put me in a one person boat. So I went from practice of eight, three eights next to each other, which was highly competitive to just in a one person boat. And it was so psychologically hard, mm. much more hard than being in a grueling practice with 20 guys. Hmm because I was all by myself. Right. And I did that like almost all year, just two hours a day, six days a week, all by myself, you yep. know, and that, that is actually very hard to do. Yeah. And, I, I think you're right. There's some interesting, um, there's some interesting psychological tendencies that we have that I've certainly noticed in myself. And I know is true in others that relates to this whole paradigm. So for one, I know personally, um, I, I view my life, my kind of personality as working in service of others. That's the thing that gets me out of bed. That makes me excited. That makes me happy. When I can, when I can work hard to make somebody else's day or to provide somebody else with value. Um, what that means though, the, 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 every trait has an upside and a downside. So that's a good thing on its own. But the downside of that is it, it means that in isolation, just like you practicing for rowing, I may be less motivated to do something for myself than I would be for others. And that actually is one reason why I have a coach. Um, I also have a coach because I'm a total knucklehead and I, I cannot program for myself. I'm, I can program for others, I just can't do it for myself for whatever reason. I always go too hard. Um, so the nice thing about having a coach is you don't wanna let down your coach. Um, I'm very unlikely to miss a training session. Sometimes it has to happen, but I can tell you that I'm even less likely to miss a training session because I know that I don't wanna message my coach, Will Morris, and let him know that uh, hey, I just I just couldn't get it done this week. I didn't I, I didn't have time. I mismanaged my schedule. Whatever. Um, so there's that effect, and then there's the effect of the of the social pressure, positive social pressure. You know, when you show up to that 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 training session, what what session are you in, by the way, David? What time slot? Um, five thirty in the morning. Five. Yeah, you're one of these freaking maniacs. Yeah, five five thirty well, in the morning. It's, it's like what time does not keep me from parenting keep me from working sure right no it makes perfect <laughs> sense it's it's logical i just i don't have uh i'm not a morning person let's put it that way um and i've, I've read some recent studies that have uh, justified me not being a, a morning person which has been yeah. uh, satisfying to, to understand oh it's, it's always good to be smart enough to read enough studies that support you it, w yeah i can justify <laughs> any position that i want to take um so you're one of these guys that wakes up at 5 30 in the morning um and if there is just a, a missing person in the session, that that changes the social dynamic, and you'll probably hear from others in the class, and um, and and even negative um, negative side effects aside, you know, you you 
are, are motivated to go see these people. You want to spend time with them. It feels good to be around people that uh, are invested in your success and that are going to high five you when you set a squat PR. Um, so I think I think those are some, from my point of view, you know, psychological, um, I guess, traits or whatever the word you might use is that that influence how this all comes together and why why the gyms end up being such an important place for community. It's like doing something hard with other men, with other people, men, largely men in my group, but there's, there's women that a lot of women actually at the gym as well, but doing something hard together and having real conversations. Um, you know, I think, I think over time, that's how friendships are formed. It's a, it's like, you have to like interact with someone about 30 times to consider someone a friend. Um, but I think when you have common interests and you suffer, it kind of, it kind of, does a faster, better job, you know? I totally agree. Yeah. And in fact, um, I just listened to an excellent podcast with a really sharp thinker in the world of submission grappling. His name's John Donaher. He was on the Lex Friedman podcast. And okay. he was talking about soldiers that when they come back from service, how it's so difficult for them to reintegrate into normal life and how the jujitsu studio provides them with some some semblance of what they're used to with the camaraderie, with the shared suffering, with the simulated yep. death by being strangled by your opponent, this sort of thing. Um, and uh, th that is that is a beautiful thing. And that's one of the things that's attracted me to martial arts my entire life, just that um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a psychological release um, to have your ego smashed, to be completely um, fatigued physically, uh, and to to truly have a pecking order in the gym of you know no bullshit no fluffing up your own <laughs> your own capability in your mind where do you stand against the people sitting next to you and um, you know it's not it's not nearly as extreme at a starting strength gym what we what we do is hard but it's definitely not preparing for a fight um, but for a lot of people this is the closest thing that they've ever experienced to that and I feel like the safer society has gotten. And the more we've advanced, in quotes, the further we've gotten away from our physical reality, which I know is something that, that Mark Ripito, uh, of all people, is um, acutely tuned into. I mean, it's one of the first lines in the blue book. And um, one of the main things I want to do in this particular episode and just in my career in general is to help get people reconnected with their physical existence. And what you're saying is that when you do that, you will be happier and you'll live longer. Um, yeah, which is fascinating. You you'll be happier, and you'll live longer. And the years that you live, you'll be more mentally sharp, right? I think it. You know, when you're when you're young in your thirties, you're not thinking like, oh, dementia is a reality that a lot of people face. Um, it's like I'm going to work hard till I'm sixty five. I'm going to retire. Uh, or 70 and then I'm gonna go explore the world. It's like or you retire at 65 and then you have so many health complications that it's like you can't leave your town, you know, because you're constantly seeing doctors. So I don't know. It's like longevity, but it's also the quality of life in the midst of the longevity that I think people want. Yep. I don't think people are really thinking about it um beyond their it's like not a lot of people think about what they're going to be like 20 years from now. I don't know if that really even motivates me in particular. Right. But I, I think it's like, it's a good investment in that future. Yep. Yep. Nonetheless. And back to the prior point about different personality types and inborn traits, you have to have the foresight and the ability to plan for the future to want to make investments. A lot of people live paycheck to paycheck, day to day, some no, by no fault of their own, but but others because, uh, I guess in both cases, it's no fault of their own, whether it's the circumstance they find themselves in, even though they have more capability, um, or because they just don't have the capability, which is which is awfully sad. Um, and so what, what do people do, David? I mean, I, I wanna give some people some actionable advice, and, and there, are, there are several people listening to this that, um, are not happy and maybe strength training, maybe not. Um, there are just oceans of people out there that we will not reach that are very unhappy. You can see it when you walk the streets of, of any major city in this country. Um, wh what do people do? What is your advice? If someone is, is listening to us speak and they're like, you know what, I want to get my shit together. I've been in a rut. I'm unhappy. 
Um, things could be better. That's a very that's a very difficult question to answer, but I'm just curious if you have some some general thoughts on where someone could mm -hmm. get started. Um, well, you know, it's kind of, I, I kind of think about what is the easiest win for someone. So for example, let's say you weigh 300 pounds and you're strong, but you have obstructive sleep apnea and it's like, okay, what's the easiest win for that person going to be? Well, it's probably either use their CPAP or get that dental prosthesis thing that changes your jaw at night. So you don't have sleep apnea. Like, okay, that could be the easy win. Or let's say they've never, let's say they've struggled depression. They're, they're lifting. That's like the one thing that keeps them sane, 50% sane, but they've never done psychotherapy. It's like, okay, find a good psychotherapist. Um, I've had a number of people from the strength community that have reached out that I've seen for a year or two years. And it's like, it's made all the difference. Just interpersonally, how they look at themselves, how they look at their wives, how they parent. Um, I would say psychotherapy is with a good therapist. And I would define a good therapist as someone who can deeply understand you, has good empathy, is wise. Um, and you know, who friends and family would want to refer to as well. You know, it's kind of like, it could, it could be hard to find the right therapist, but to, but to pay for good therapy, I think is very valuable. People will pay for a $40,000 car. You know, will you pay for therapy for 10,000 or I guess a more expensive therapist might be around 20,000 a year. You know, it's like, would you pay for that for one year? If that would change your life, probably, but it still sounds like a lot of money. So yeah, seeing a good therapist could be life changing, getting your sleep apnea taken care of. Um, and then if you are doing, if you're inconsistent with exercise and you're unable to set up a structure in your own internal world without a coach, without a gym, and you're near a gym or you, you could get a coach, like change your environment to do that, you know? Hmm. Um, and, you know, like, let's say you don't have a lot of money, that you're a student. I'm sure there's a, a young starting strength apprentice who will give you a good deal. You know, I mean, I'm sure there's that person out there. So you, sometimes you just have to chase down and ask, um, you know, who is, who is someone who will, not charge me half my salary, right? Or something mm. like that, if you're really struggling financially. Mm. Um, and then, you know, for a lot of these young young people, it's like their parents have resources. Their parents like may not realize how important it is. And so parents will pay for them to see me as a psychiatrist, but sometimes they won't pay for them to go to a gym. And so I have this conversation with parents sometimes where I'm like, hey, stop coming to see me as frequently and go to the gym. Nice. You know, nice. <laughs> like, if they're seeing, you know, it's like, I would rather you pay that money to go to a gym. And they, it's like, I have so many of these conversations to get people to actually work out and often not as much success as I would like. So it's like, mm. if I can motivate people through a, through a podcast or through coming on here to, to get activated, it's like, uh, that may, that makes me very satisfied because sometimes it's like people, people will know that this is what's going to help them, but they don't take any steps towards that. Yep. Yep. Let me, uh, <clears throat> let me share my point of view on this. I think you've nailed it with training. Um, psychotherapy. I agree. If you can find a good one, I don't know what your perspective is on the level of quality across your industry, but, um, I've struggled to find a good one. Um, just tried a new guy last week for some marriage counseling, just getting some tips and tools to have a, to better understand my wife and have her better understand me, all this adult stuff, you know, as we have a new baby coming into the world. Um, he's, he's okay. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's still early days. I'm going to give him a shot, but it's tough finding a good one. Um, sleep. So, so being around toddlers and babies has really illuminated what it takes to be in a good mood because when are babies and toddlers the most pissed off? It's like when they haven't slept and when they're hungry. So it's like, get your nutrition in order, get your sleep in order. Those are very difficult things, but solve problems that you have related to sleep. One of those, by the way, for the vast majority of people is most likely smartphone use. Um, the CPAP's crucial if you're a heavy guy. Um, 
or even if you're not heavy sometimes like yeah. I have this like no, good 120 point. pound guy I just got on a a dental prosthesis for sleep apnea and he said I finally slept yep. awesome yep but it's like if 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 you have not had a sleep study and you're like I don't want to go to a sleep study well then go buy a little pulse oximeter to go on your finger at night mm. and see if you're desatting you know if you go through the night and have no desaturations, you're probably okay. But if mm. you have a bunch of desaturation events, definitely invest in a good, a good doctor visit, you know, to. Yeah. And for those of you that are interested in this device that David's referring to, it's called a mandibular. And I tried it prior to getting a CPAP and it improved my apnea, but it didn't, you know, improve it enough. So I went for the okay. CPAP, which was a fantastic investment i mean a, a okay a truly okay, i thought you were going to say it was miserable no 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 this but... i mean it was a complete pain in the ass for the first few nights i'm like how in the world am i ever yeah. going to get used to a supercharger attached to my face um but uh when i use my cpap i wake up so much happier so much more clear-headed right. and you can see it yeah. in my face and then when i don't use a cpap the opposite is true we talked about relationships, David. Dave, um, relationships are crucial, and that's why the community aspect is so crucial in our gyms, more so than ever. And I would just say that um, online relationships are pretty paper thin. You need to be able to look someone in the eye. You need to be able to uh, see how what you're saying to them and how you're behaving is affecting them and how what they're saying and how they're behaving is affecting you. There's so much more to a relationship than typing on a keyboard. I hate to, to even have to say that, but I feel it's worth mentioning. Um, and then there's a, there's a mantra that I have, David, that I wanted to share with you. And I've had to say this to myself repeatedly, sometimes several times per day, um, as an entrepreneur, because entrepreneurship is, is a, a chronic bout of stress. It is unrelenting. It is a uh, simulated drowning. It is juggling with knives. It is, uh, ah. it, it is, ex I, it, it is extremely difficult, especially, especially if you're doing it self-funded and you're constantly at risk of going bankrupt, um, okay. and this and the reputation risk and the the attention and the the stakes are so high and and so the thing that I've I've used um, to help me deal with this stress is just just two simple phrases: lower the stakes, let go. And those those yeah. have been helpful to me. And sometimes it's not possible, but just the having the presence of mind to note that I'm in an anxious state and I'm worried or scared about what might happen due to a, a big problem that we're experiencing helps kind of reduce the the mental load so just curious what your reaction is to that i like that i like that and it is it is very stressful to be an entrepreneur and to have your money on the line and your and your um and your ego on the line so mm -hmm. to speak um i think that what i was thinking was um, sometimes anxiety, the, the better word for it is anger. And sometimes mm. it's excite, excitement. Mm. And I think in our culture, in our day and age, we lump everything into the anxiety category. Whereas like excitement and anxiety feel pretty similar. Mm. And so I think when you, when you feel, when you feel anxious, ask yourself next time, am I angry? Am I excited? And if you're angry, then it's like, okay, what's the obstacle that I need to overcome? Because anger is actually the energy to overcome obstacles. Mm. And then it's just focusing on the next step. That's all you can do. And if if you're like in, unable to sleep because you're thinking about these obstacles and stuff, just wake up, pull out a journal, write the obstacle, write the next step when you're going to schedule that next step. That's very important. And then you can remind yourself that the rest of the night, if you wake up, it's like, nope, I'm not going to worry about this right now. I'm worrying about this tomorrow at this time, or I'm doing this next step tomorrow at this time. Um, and so that's one way to manage those, like those thoughts. Mm -hmm. And then also just, I think for entrepreneurs, like, it's like, what's the other option? It's like, you're going to be bored to death working a nine to five. I guarantee you. Yeah. Like you are there's, there's like an, there's like an exploration, you know, I think about like Alexander the Great. It's like, I think Alexander the Great would have kept invading lands forever. You know, <laughs> it was like so much pleasure and dopamine for him to extend the kingdom. He just kept extending it. And it's like, 
he was always asking himself the question, like, why, how do I get these men to want to keep going? Mm -hmm. Right. Because as time goes on, the, you know, other people will be like, well, what I really care about is going back to my family. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, but we but, can conquer. What are you talking about? <laughs> but we can keep going, you know? Um, so, yeah, those are some of my thoughts. Where do, where do drugs come into the picture in your practice? What is your, what is your take in general on the topic of treating mental illness with drugs? Because, and the reason I pose this question is, one of the reasons why when you go see your GP and you complain about... Um, or, you know, he's worried about your cholesterol levels or your blood sugar, heart health, whatever, right? One of the reasons why your GP doesn't prescribe exercise is because he can prescribe you a pill. Well, that's not the only reason. One of them. I'm, I'm the other reason is because clients... the government is organized crime, but we can get into that later. <laughs> one, one of my clients is a, is, a, is a cardiologist, and he's a very good cardiologist. And when as we progressed in our, our work together, he started talking about exercise with more clients. And one thing he's noticed is the amount of shame that comes up with the average person's experience when you start talking about exercise and diet and weight loss is so large. Interesting. Um, and so I think that one of the reasons why doctors don't talk about it more is because of the pushback we get like from, from clients. And it only takes like, 10% of your clients to revolt for you to go like, I don't ever want to have this conversation again. And so then I start noticing myself just talking about like, Oh, just get more steps, you know, where I, in my mind, I'm like, no, like to really get a big dose response, you need to be all in, you know, you need to like, you need to do strength training. You need to do some cardio, you know, it's like, you need, to hit all these levers and hit them hard if you want this to actually be a dose response and you're going to need a coach. Um, so where do medications fit in? Um, if someone is truly schizophrenic or bipolar, and I say true bipolar because a lot of people are loosely diagnosed bipolar, I think they're going to need meds the rest of their life. If, and schizophrenia, you know, paranoid, hearing voices, people chasing them, not touch with reality. And insight is actually very low in true schizophrenia true bipolar up for weeks straight unable to sleep on a special mission go 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 you know in the middle of the night what are they doing grandiose goal-directed activities right they're not just watching tv or walking around cleaning so that's true that's true mania and grandiose as in like they see themselves as way different than they normally do that's true bipolar Okay, if someone's depressed, there's many different treatments for depression. Medications will work one third of the time. Um, I don't have any issue prescribing them. You know, I don't want people to be on them for the rest of their life, like medic, you know, like SSRIs and SNRIs, like Zoloft or Prozac or stuff like this. It's it's a solution until they can fix some of the lifestyle stuff. So every one of my clients. If they're on these, they, they often come in on these meds, right? I may increase them, get them out of depression, get them out of the panic attacks, right? That's my goal. And then once they're out of depression, or once they've gotten some dose response, but not a complete response, we have to add in the lifestyle stuff. We have to change our diet. We have to change our exercise. We have to change our sleep. Um, and then once they're not depressed for like six months, I want to, I want to slowly get them off their medication. And a lot of my patients are on medications, which cause cognitive doling. You know, they're not themselves because of their medications. If you're on like a benzodiazepine, like Xanax, Clonopin, like you, you are going to be not as sharp as you were off these meds. It's just like alcohol. Like if someone's drinking four to five drinks a day, you're not going to be as sharp as you would be otherwise. Um, you, it's like joy and moderation, right? It's the key. And if you're depressed or really like mentally ill, you may need to completely stop alcohol for a season just to kind of let your brain reboot, um, let yourself kind of get back on your feet. And that may be more important than medications, honestly. Mm. So yeah, medications in moderation. Um, and 
you know, the other thing was like testosterone. I saw one of your episodes lately on like testosterone. It's like, mm. and Rip, Rip used to call me and like, Dr. Pewter, you know, why aren't you prescribing testosterone to all your patients? It's like, <laughs> um, it's, it's well, a good question, psychotherapy, man. And that's what it's, I enjoy. It's a fantastic um, question. You know, it's, it's like, I, I prescribe, who, I'll tell you who I enjoy prescribing testosterone to. It's like women in their 70s who are sarcopenic or men in their 70s who are severely sarcopenic. Mm -hmm. Like those are the patients, those are the only patients that I've prescribed at this time. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that a young person like yourself or or myself wouldn't benefit at times. And that's, that's, a, that's another conversation. But just to kind of like, when is it the biggest win? It's when you have someone with sarcopenia like low muscle mass, super low muscle mass, who is older and female or male, both of those, I think it's like, it's a potential win. Mm -hmm. And there's some good studies to support that. Low risk, extraordinarily high reward. Um, That's right. I have uh, several buddies on testosterone. I'm on testosterone, as you know, and um, I, I can tell you that uh, the, the physical effects are great. You know, um, it's, it's nice to have a little less body fat, a little more muscle. I'm not going to take a drug and run an experiment on myself just for that purpose. That's, that's a little vain. Um, although you can argue that there are health benefits to that and there certainly are all the downsides are not known because it's a complex system and there are, there are side effects of testosterone. Speaking of sleep apnea, your, your neck grows, um, hemoglobin and hematocrit go up. There's debate about whether or not that matters. There's, there are downsides, but, um, I can say that one of the best things I've ever done for my mental health is get on testosterone. And I was at a total testosterone of 289 nanograms per deciliter at age 32, I think. Don't know if that's a result of my lifestyle, chronic stress, uh, Crohn's disease, whatever, who knows? You're, there's, you're never gonna find the cause. But um, yeah, I think, I think, I think RIP uh, promoting testosterone for its psychological benefits for those that need it. I think I think I, I definitely agree with Steph, Rip's partner on this, which is be very careful when you're when you're messing with drugs, especially if you're it's a, if it's potentially a drug you'll have to take for the rest of your life. You know, don't take that decision lightly. But if you have a genuine problem to solve, um, it's it's worth looking into. And I'm I'd be very very curious to know if you end up dabbling with your patients what kind of outcomes you see. And in fact, if you're a betting man, I'd be happy to place a large wager. Mm. Okay. <laughs> well, it's, it's, yeah, it's like, what do you, what do you treat first is always my question. For right? sure. Yeah. It's like, if, if someone, if someone comes in with super low testosterone and I do measure it, then it's like, it's like one thing, but it's like, if they're not even lifting, if they're not even exercising, if they're obese, you know, and they're, that testosterone is going to just convert to estrogen, maybe, you know, yeah. there's so many things. Yep. So it's like, what do you, what do you treat first? What is, what is the next step? What is the biggest win? These are questions I ask myself all the time. Yeah. And um, like I have this one client who's like 500 pounds. It's like the biggest win for him is a GLP-1 medication, which is like Ozempic, which decreases your appetite. And the studies show in about one year, the weight loss is 20%. Now, I, did, I, I think, you know, there's a lot of guys in starting strength who are overweight and maybe unnecessarily and maybe would benefit from some good treatment of that. And or just eating like less eat. shit, really. A lot of guys use strength training as an excuse to eat whatever they want. Um, they're like, oh, you know, it's the gains. I'm gonna gain muscle, I can, I can eat these big right. meals. I can eat like I did on my NLP, which is a, is a mistake and it's not healthy to be, to be uh, significant, to have, you know, 30% body fat as a guy, even if you're squatting 400, 500 pounds, it's, it's probably not good for your health, you know? You, you at, at some point you want to go through a phase of weight loss and i think that's um maybe my my opinion and my thought is like that's important for longevity it's important for long-term cognitive function it's like opt full optimization of your metabolic function is yes. what i'm after agreed and being overweight you know if your waist is like 46 inches or something like that it's like yeah what can we do you know, and I, I wouldn't, the first phase would be getting strong. Mm. Like if someone was not strong or not exercising at all, like that would be for me, like number one, but at some point doing a season of six months or a year of like, let's, let's cut off all the fat. Yep. 
Yep. Yeah, I think uh, like, we... being strong and on the leaner side is much better than being strong and uh, and significantly uh, obese. Sorry, sorry. Are you are you having to go, doctor? Am I cutting into your next appointment? Yeah, you know, I got to head out for the family more than anything else. Right but on. We could do part two another time. I'd be down to look at that, man. Clear time. priorities, clear boundaries. You practice what you preach. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. I've got a page full of notes, so we may need to do a second one here. Um, I love the fact that you're prescribing strength training to your patients. I think that's powerful. I think that's positive. I hope other people um, listen to this podcast, take note of those studies, do the same thing that are in your field. Um, and I'll let you just mention anything you want to mention that we didn't have a chance to cover so far. But just to the audience, if you have any questions for Dr. Pewter, just hit us in uh, the YouTube comments, hit us on the forum. Um, we, we, have, we have great people that are involved in this community that have um, really valuable skill sets. And in this case, it's how to optimize your mind to live a fulfilled and happy life. And that's what is more important than that, right? Um, that's kind of why we're all here. That's kind of the point of strength training. So um, I'd like us to, to leverage uh, Dr. Peter's expertise. And if you have questions for him, feel free to ask them and we'd be happy to invite him back on the show to have round two. So let, let us know. Um, David, hit us with uh, anything else you want to mention before we wrap and then please plug whatever you want to plug your website, your podcast, anything that you'd like to promote. Yeah. So we didn't get to it, but next time, maybe this will be like a teaser. Okay. For, for next time is we're going to talk about this new study that came out like just this, just this, uh, this month on the mechanism for how low skeletal muscle mass decreases cognitive function. Hmm. And it, they go through the mechanisms of it. And it's absolutely beautiful. One thing they point out is that think about muscle as like an endocrine tissue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the, the mitochondria density in the muscles is also linked to mitochondria density in the brain tissue. So if you have dysfunction in one, you're going to have dysfunction in the other. And what we want in our brain cells is, is lots of healthy mitochondria. And so a lot of mental health is physical health and metabolic health. And I think, you know, with the, with the increase in, you know, not moving and social media, people are less likely to be having good metabolic health. Hmm. And so, so yeah, I would say a um, good way to connect with me is through social media, Instagram, it's just what what is my name here it's like dr at david pewter or something like that you know your relationship um, with social media is on the healthier side if you don't recall your own handles so that's good to hear i can't i don't even know how to look this up um i'll, I'll send you a link yeah we'll put it on the, the show, show notes um and pl I, please you know, send me the links to the uh to all the stuff you referenced today too so that people can can take a close look i have a podcast psychiatry and psychotherapy if you just look up psychiatry or my name david pewter you'll find it and I've done a bunch of episodes on strength training there and I have more coming out. Like I'll do, I'm going to do like a, an update this year, like with the new studies coming out. And it's, it's like a nerdy deep dive to convince people in my field that it's important. You know, I think like even in my field, we get, we get preached a lot that like medic about medications because like there's a lot of drug reps that make a lot of money off of us prescribing medications, but there's no one yelling about exercise. So I like to be the person that kind of like, yells about exercise occasionally which um, based on the and, studies appears to be probably one of the most important things yeah so so yeah i don't know thanks for having me on it was good and uh look forward to coming back and we'll continue the conversation yeah i i want to thank you very much for not only coming on the show but for doing important work i mean i think um uh the people in the world that um spend their time trying to improve the quality of others existence should be uh commended for the work that they're doing. And, and I want to thank you for that, David. I hope to talk to you again soon. All right. Take All right. care. Thanks.